Welcome to another unit in this SPSS course. In this unit, I'm going to talk about how we can use SPSS and the R essentials for SPSS to run a zero inflated count model. Well, first comment, what is R, the R essentials for SPSS? That's like a plug-in or add-on for SPSS, which allows us to use additional functionalities, additional commands. If you never heard about this and haven't yet installed them, you can visit the corresponding unit in this course where I explain in detail well, what they are, what their advantages are thereof, and in particular, how you can install them, where you can find them, and also how you can select corresponding functionalities. Well, under this assumption that this works fine for you, we can then take a look at what I mentioned with zero inflated count models. Count models, that's well, that's special case of first off sensor data and on the other hand a specific case where we no longer have continuous dependent variables. So in other words we simply assume that our dependent variable only takes natural numbers as values. So all values from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are possible, but only, as I said, starting at 0 and only integers. Well, that's the first part. That are, is what count models are about. Zero inflation means that, for some reason, the zero is way more present in the data set than it's supposed to be. So, for example, you have a lot of zero situations for example if you work with uh, insurances a lot of days a lot of weeks when no accident happened at all with one client and then potentially one or two or something like this or in the case i'm going to take a look at it's about regional patenting so i have a lot of regions which do not patent at all and then for those who do patent, the question is, how many patents do they actually have? So that's basically what zero inflation is all about. But before we can start, we have to do one step before this. So I first go to descriptive statistics and frequencies. And for my dependent variable, which here is this one, I'm going to calculate first the mean and the variance. If I click OK, do this here, I see that the variance is way larger than the mean. Even the standard deviation is way larger than the mean. Why is this important? Because this, in a moment, we will need when we decide which of the underlying count models we are going to use. Because Whenever this is the case, that the variance is way larger than the mean, then we talk about over-dispersion. When we have over-dispersion, then we have to use the so-called negative binomial approach and not the Poisson approach. Okay, so much for the preliminary work. I will get back to those results in a moment. However, when we want to actually do our regression analysis, we are not going here to regression. Of course, well, as you take a look here, you cannot find anything of the stuff I talked about. We have to go back up to the gen uh, generalized linear models. And here we find zero inflated count models. If I click here, I see the typical structure with dependent and here two fields for independence. That's actually something I'm going to get back in a moment. But before this, I go to options. Of course, here in the upper part, I have to decide which underlying count model I'm using. Usually, it's a question between Poisson and negative binomial. And as I said, Poisson, I'm only going to use if mean and variance are equal. Here, in this example, I had over dispersion. And with over dispersion, I'm going to use negative binomial. So that's the part I have to change here with regards to how my mean and my variance look like. With the link functions, well, we can leave it as is. You can also change this, but, well, usually works decent enough with a logit. So this is basically 
for the first step, which I'm going to do here. Then we can get back to our original model. So here, first step is select a dependent. That's as I said, my patterns. Then I want to explain them by the number of researchers in the reason uh, in a region and whether they produce oil or gas and by which quantity they produce it. If I leave it as is, so with this box checked, he will use the same variables in the zero model. Okay, what's the zero model? As I said, well, the problem is I have too many zeros. So what he does here is he first runs, in this case, a logit model, where he estimates whether this region actually has the chance of getting a one with the patterns. And then under the assumption that it has a chance, or the under the assumption that it's a one here, then he estimates the model up here. So this is similar to what I discussed in the unit on the Heckman selection model. So two partial models down here, something like a logit, zero or no, a one, and up here, the actual model I'm interested in, depending on this turns out one. Well, if I leave it as is, he will use in the zero model the same predictors as here. So he would use those two here as well. If I want to change this, you can just select this. And then, for example, add also other values. And that's actually the problem. If I want to add, for example, the same ones as here, but then I also want to add like government personnel. Usually you would think, yeah, I can leave it as is with this checked and then just add only government personnel. Uh, with this, it, however, won't work. So as soon as the list here deviates from the list up here, enter this one after another. Then we can click OK. Take some time. Here's the results. So that's our two partial models here. So this is the first step, the zero inflation model. So at this point, we see, well, the model itself is not really this good. But if I run my count model, I have a highly significant impact factor and that's my researchers per region. So this is basically the idea. I run two separate models. And this is actually the model I'm interested in. This is like a step in between. And then this is really the results I'm mainly interested in. And well, he provides me significant tests for them as well. However, the big problem with this is, even if I take a look here at this table, it's well not telling me a lot about overall model quality. It's also not telling me quite a lot whether the assumption that I have zero inflation is actually the correct one. Because in this context, I just have to accept this, that if I take a look, for example, at the frequency table, he tells me, yeah, you supposedly have zero inflation. But I'm not really sure. And usually if you go into details, what you would do, you would first run a so-called Vuong test. Here, however, at least up to this point, I haven't yet found any possibility to run this test and thereby test for zero inflation. Also, you could test whether over dispersion really is a problem. However, in this case, well, you would have to run a pure negative binomial or pure Poisson model, which also, well, is relatively limited in the normal approach. You can do this if you go to generalized linear models and then start here, which would allow you to run a pure count model. But there's nothing like where you can go, okay, count models and then go with, yeah, I want to run a Poisson model. And well, that's a small downside. However, as you've seen with this example, it's still possible to decide 
what or how to make your decisions. You can decide whether you use negative binomial or Poisson by just taking a look at mean and variance. And if you take a look at frequency tables, you can decide whether zero inflation seems prudent in your opinion or not. And well, that's then already all I wanted to talk about in this context. So I hope you enjoyed this session. And if you want to see additional input on SPSS, feel free to visit the rest of this course or have a look at the corresponding playlist. I say goodbye and see you next time.